Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our first webinar of 2020, uh, where we're going to be talking about cylindrical gear microgeometry in master. So if you do have a question at any point during the webinar, please do uh, put it down in the questions panel. I'll either try and answer it as we're going along, or otherwise I'll try and answer them on a one-to-one -one basis at the end. Uh, we'll just see how we get on with that. So what I want to start off doing is just to actually give a very brief overview of the actual window layout within master in terms of the, mac uh, the micro geometry mode. So it's very similar to other modes you will have seen within master. The only difference is, as with the other gear analysis mode of macro geometry, is that the assembly tree for the entire assembly is not on the top left of the screen anymore. So what we have here is the ability to show multiple iterations of the micro geometry design. So let's say we had a few different potential design results or we were working on an optimization process for our design. We could just put multiple different iterations of the design within here. Down at the bottom, we have the analysis window. So this is pretty standard as well as many other modes in master. So we can see all the different load cases and duty cycles within our models. The only change here is the ability to choose between basic and advanced LTCA. So I'll go into more detail on these in a, in a, a bit later on. However, at the moment, I just want to talk about LTCA as a whole and what how that integrates into master. So LTCA is kind of what this mode hinges around, so the microgeometry mode. So basically we specify the microgeometry onto our gear geometry, and then we run one of these LTCA analysis to get some various results out of this. So if I switch over to a presentation really quickly. I just want to look at the analysis summary. So this is going to be very brief. It's just giving a general overview of what gets fed into the LTCA, so the loaded tooth contact analysis. So into the LTCA calculation, we have various things fed in. So we have the macro geometry of the gears, we have the input torque, we have the misalignment, which is calculated in system deflection mode and then passed over, and we have our assigned micro geometry. Now, once that's been run through our LTCA calculation, basic or advanced, there's various outputs we get from that, uh, one of which being transmission error. We also get things like contact stresses, load distribution, and depending on the type of LTCA we're using, which again I'll go into later on, we can also get root stresses. That information also gets fed into the ISO standards for gear ratings, which then allows you to get things like damage and safety factors. So it's a all in one package really, and it gives you quite a high level or high fidelity analysis for your gear ratings and for uh, TE and contacts and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm gonna have a look at one of the other tabs available in the micro geometry mode, which is this actual micro geometry tab up here. So what you will find with the micro geometry mode is that it tends to be a lot of sub tabs. So we have things grouped together in quite uh, generic tabs, and then there will be more options in subsequent tabs underneath. Uh, micro geometry tab being the most numerous of these. So this is basically where we actually specify the micro geometry on our gears. Uh, there's different ways of doing this. So I'm going to start off just in the editor here. Now, like all editors within master, this is fully customizable. So you don't have to view inputs in this way. You can create your own editor formats to input just the parameters you're interested in in just the way you're interested in. However, if you wanna stick with our default one, you can do as well. And what we have here, so a third set of tabs, is the ability to specify lead relief and profile relief. And I'll come onto these charts in a little bit as to how we actually specify this. And we can specify bias in there as well. What we can do in addition is to actually import some micro geometry from external sources. So 
for example, if you wanted to try and validate your design, uh, so look at the validation of contact pattern or try and validate your transmission error or MBH behavior, you'd want to try and import an actual measured microgeometry design or, or what's actually been manufactured. So we can do this with the functionality available of importing a microgeometry matrix or importing microgeometry from an external file. And what it basically allows us to do is to import sort of a, a grid of deviation values, sort of face width versus roll distance or whatever you use for your profile measurement. And using that, we're, that replaces the specified microgeometry and you can use that to actually calculate your transmission error and contact and whatever else. So before we go too far into specifying anything like this, so any of these properties, we need to talk a little bit about conventions within microgeometry mode, because this does cause some confusion sometimes. So the first thing I want to talk about is misalignment. So within master, misalignment is defined as a relative displacement in the plane of action. Uh, and it's essentially the maximum minus the minimum separation between teeth along the face width. Uh, and as you can see in the little image on the right there, if we're looking in terms of the local Z coordinate system, the local Z axis of the gear itself, so you can get to this within master. So if you look in your 3D view, for example, it's going to show you the local coordinate system of the gear. We're looking along the Z axis of the gear. And if it's separating at a higher Z value, then it's a positive misalignment, and at the lower end, it's a negative misalignment. So a little bit more information on misalignment as well. So this kind of just shows the different calculation methods we have for misalignment, uh, and kind of gives an image of a representation of how it is calculated. So what we essentially have on the right-hand side here is the node or the mesh nodes for that particular gear set in this case there's five on each gear and from those mesh nodes we can actually get the deflection in the line of action of the individual gears so we have the pinion and the wheel here which gives us a net deflection and it's from this line of net deflection across the face uh, which allows us to gets these different values for misalignment. So we have three different misalignment types. The default is the equivalent misalignment for rating, which is based on the ISO methodology, which is essentially, if we're looking at this net deflection, we're essentially looking at the maximum point using that value. We have the line fit misalignment, which is sort of a, a line of best fit through that net deflection curve. And then we can calculate the value from that. And then we have total rigid body misalignment as well, which is a, a methodology which looks at the deflection of the actual shaft nodes rather than the ones at the mesh. So it's slightly different in the way it calculates. Uh, just to reiterate, the default one that we use within master and the one that we recommend is the total equivalent misalignment for rating, which is the one that uses the ISO standard. So last bit of information on misalignment. So the microgeometry model is included in the misalignment calculation. However, it is a simplified version. So when you're actually setting up a load case, if I go back to master for a second and go to a load case, on these cylindrical gear meshes within a load case, you'll see that there's this microgeometry model in system deflection option. It has three options in here. It can either have none, where it will put no misalignment on the, the gear geometry at all. It will have, you, know, you can have estimated from macro geometry, but it will just estimate a crowning value based on some of your macro geometry parameters. And you have specified micro geometry, which uses a simplified representation of your actual specified micro geometry in the micro geometry mode. So mesh nodes are loaded 
uh, including the microgeometry model. So whatever microgeometry model you've specified is used in loading up these mesh nodes, which we can kind of see here. And then once we've actually run our simulation through and we've got some convergence um, in our system, everything's settled down, the convergent the converged component positions include the effects of that microgeometry model. Also, the microgeometry model is included for the gear ratings in system deflection. So if you're looking at gear ratings in the system deflection mode, it would have that microgeometry model included. However, when the misalignment calculation is performed, so when you actually get the value of misalignment out of system deflection, that microgeometry model is removed. So that basically means that we can then perform that subsequent loaded tooth contact analysis over the top of this with our applied microgeometry in order to correct that misalignment. <clears throat> so a bit of information on flank definition. So the flank is defined with respect to the gear local coordinate system z-axis. So again, in master I showed uh, how you would see the local coordinate system of the gear and what we're essentially saying here is that if you have the z-axis pointing into the screen and you have the tooth facing upwards then the left flank is on the left hand side and the right flank is on the right <clears throat> so a bit more specification on relief so you'll see this a few times as we're going through the webinar today in a few different tabs in master the definition of relief and it is defined as the normal or it's defined relief is defined in the transverse transverse plane normal to the involute profile and what it essentially means is material removed or added to the involute shape so negative relief indicates material taken away so what you'll see if you've not got any microgeometry specified is that the relief is always going to be set to zero However, this just means that it's just a pure involute shape of the tooth. So if you're applying some microgeometry on there and then you look at a plot which shows the relief, it's going to show you either the material that's been taken away from that involute or added to that involute. <clears throat> so linear lead relief. The reason we've included this in here is that different sources seem to define a positive or negative linear lead relief in slightly different ways. So by linear lead relief, we also mean uh, sometimes called helix angle modification or lead slope or can be referred to as multiple different things. I'm not going to go through this in a massive amount of detail, but this plot is available uh, in the help file and you'll be able to find it here on this webinar on the website just to show you a comparison between the different sources. Uh, if you want to switch between them, you can do so within the master settings. So by default, we're obviously going to have the master default setup, but you can switch to use the LDP definition and the rating definition as well. So ISA, AGMA, DIN, whatever else. Okay, so next we're going to talk about edge relief. So a little bit confusing with the edge relief. So the face width parameter is defined with respect to the gear's local z-axis. So again, this is the same as we were talking about before. With a lower z value, you're looking at the lower end of the face width scale. And then as you increase the z-axis value, then you go in towards a higher end of the face width. Um, and we're kind of defining edge relief on a tooth basis rather than a flank basis. So what that essentially means, if you can see the image on the right hand side there, is that left relief is going to be on the same end of the tooth for both the left and the right flank. And then the same with right relief, which is dependent on how you look at it. It might seem a little counterintuitive, but it is the way it is defined. OK, so a little bit of information on the modification charts and how exactly we would read this and how we actually define things here. So this is a very simple microgeometry specification, just looking at the lead specification on one flank of our gear set. And 
this is kind of a tale of two halves here. So that on the right hand side, we just have a specification of crowning and then there's no end relief defined. And what we're essentially seeing here is that we have a total of 13 microns of crowning here, but we do only actually have 10 microns defined between our evaluation limits. So our evaluation limits are defined by these dotted vertical lines. And our evaluation limits here are set between one millimeter and 15 millimeters. And between those, we have a crowning value specified of 10 microns. So you can see that as this crowning value passes the evaluation limit, it's on 10 microns. However, if we carry this on to the end of the tooth, it's going down, it's continuing the same trend down to about 13 microns of crowning. So in terms of specifying an end relief on here, so on the left-hand side, we have an end relief specified, and we have the start of end relief, or left relief, specified at two millimeters. And then we have a value of 10 microns specified to, or as linear left relief. So what this basically means is that if we were carrying down this crowning line all the way down to the end of the tooth, it will come down to 13 microns, same as this side, and then that's where we're measuring our additional 10 microns that are being added on to, added on for the linear left relief. Okay. So next I am gonna talk a bit about the basic and advanced LTCA functionality within master and a bit of the understanding of what goes on behind the scenes with regards to that. So just to reiterate how we would choose between these, basic LTCA and advanced LTCA are, are selected as part of the analysis setting. So any load case within your model or duty cycle or design state, you can run as either basic or advanced LTCA. So basic LTCA is a simple strip methodology, uh, which is quite quick to run, but slightly less accurate. And I'll show you a little bit of comparative validation of these later on. Advanced LTCA utilizes a, uh, an FE model with inside master itself. So to go back to my PowerPoint, and I'm just gonna go through these fairly rapidly to not take up too much time. So for basic LTCA, a simple strip method is used. So to begin, we draw the contact lines on their respective teeth. So on here, we've just sort of visualized it on one tooth. However, of course, they would be on their respective teeth. And then we essentially say that each contact line is divided into a number of strips. Now, the number of strips is actually controlled by a setting within master itself. So the user can choose this. These are found within the settings menu. So if I go to edit, settings and then cylindrical gear ratings you'll see down at the bottom here under ltca options we have the ability to choose the number of load strips for basic ltca and the number of rotations which i'll come on to in a minute Okay, and then we also need to note that strips on the same contact line are likely coupled with one another as well. So this strip, for example, would be likely coupled with this one, as with this one, and so on. So for each of the strips, a calculation point is defined. And then for each contacting strip pair, so we've got the two meshing gears. So for each contacting strip pair, uh, we have a calculated stiffness value. And this is a combined value of bending and contact stiffness uh, because it's just done based on an ISO standard. So the stiffness is uh, calculated according to the ISO 6336 part one, section nine, single stiffness value, if you want to look at that in more detail. And that will essentially give us a stiffness value for each one of these strips. So because we have the stiffness for each one of those strips, at this point, we estimate the transmission error value. Uh, and then the force on that particular point is calculated. So we have the stiffness value, we have an intersection, so the TE, 
from that we can calculate the force on that particular point. We can then sum up the force on all of the different points on the different teeth and then the total force is compared with the expected uh, force defined by the input torque. So what we would expect on the first iteration is that it's going to be quite a way off. So what we essentially do is a force balancing process. So we gradually refine, iterate the process, refine the value of transmission error until we get a total force from all those strips that equals the expected force from the input torque and whatever other input loads you have defined. And once we've done this for one point, we essentially get the first calculation point or first point on our TE plot. So we do this for one position, one rotational position, it gives us a first point on our transmission error plot. However, of course, we need to see what the transmission error or how the transmission error is varying as we go through the entire uh, mesh cycle of the tooth. So to do this, we essentially rotate the gear slightly and then perform the process again. And this is that number of rotation setting I was talking about in the settings menu as well. Again, it's a user-defined property, but that will control how many different rotational points will be covered as we cover that full tooth pass. So as we complete this process for every one of those rotational positions, what we eventually build up here is the entire transmission error curve over the entire tooth pass. So each one of these steps will give us a different point on this TE plot. And then obviously, of course, from that, we can get the peak to peak transmission error value, which is one of our main metrics. So if you actually want to view this within master, you can do so. So I'll show this a bit later on in regards to the LTCA results. However, when we're actually looking at the contact pattern within master, you can show it as individual contact lines. And I don't know if the resolution's good enough on the screen here, but you can see the individual strips. And then you can also see how they behave as they are, uh, as the tooth pass occurs. <clears throat> so a few assumptions with basic LTCA. Uh, so obviously it's a very quick and simple method. We're not really using an overly accurate methodology for calculating stiffness. Uh, so the ISO 6336 single tooth stiffness, we're assuming that it is a suitable representation of true stiffness. And again, I'll show you some validations some comparisons of these a bit later on. We're assuming that the strip stiffness per unit length does not vary across the roll distance. So essentially what we're doing is calculating the strip stiffness per unit length and then scaling that to the size of the strip. So what we're assuming is that it doesn't change across the roll distance. We're assuming a constant misalignment throughout the mesh cycle. We can get rid of this assumption by introducing advanced system deflection, uh, which we'll cover some other time. We're also assuming that transmission error at the considered mesh is not influenced by the other meshes. We are not including any effect of friction or lubrication. And we're also assuming that the tooth deflection is insufficient to move the contact points from their no load position. So advanced LTCA. Uh, Really, the, the process here is very, very similar. So once we've actually calculated the stiffness of the teeth on the, the gear, which is done a little bit differently, the process is essentially the same. Uh, but we'll start off with actually how we calculate the contact and the bending stiffness here. So the master gear model is not suitable for an advanced LTCA analysis. So as a result, we have to generate full FE mesh and we do this within master itself. This is, this is not uh, any inclusion of an external FE package. We do this within master itself. So users define an FE mesh for both meshing gears. And then the stiffness with respect to the FE mesh grid is calculated. So for the actual flank here, the mesh refinement should be performed considering a stiffness matrix result, not a stress analysis. So that's critical. We can get away with a much coarser mesh 
uh, in this respect than we could do if we were doing this the similar simulation in ANSYS or any other um, FE package. The root is another story, however. So the root stress calculation does depend entirely on the FE model and the mesh density should be appropriate for that. So it should accurately reflect it. So stress influence coefficients are calculated from that defined mesh. So for the bending stiffness, the tooth bending stiffness is calculated with respect to the contact points. So the same as we did with the basic LTCA, the user specifies the number of contact points per contact line and the number of rotations per tooth pass. So it's the same properties we were specifying for the basic LTCA, just in a slightly different place. And before I forget, I will jump into master to just show where these are defined. So for advanced LTCA, what we're essentially doing is creating a mesh for the macro geometry, and then we're overlaying the micro geometry on top of that. So we need to make a mesh, an FE mesh for a macro geometry design, and then we'd be able to change the micro geometry as much as we wanted without regenerating that mesh and its associated stiffnesses. However, any change to the macro geometry would mean that we'd need to regenerate the mesh and it can be a little bit time consuming to do so. So if I go to my macro geometry mode, and I go to any one of my macro geometry designs, I can go to my FE model database, which is down in the properties, and then I get access to this FE model section. This opens up this window here, and this is essentially a database which allows us to create multiple of these if we so wish. I can add a new one, and then I just get access to various different meshing properties. So for example, we have control over the number of coupled teeth either, either side of the current mesh. Uh, we have the ability to refine the mesh density on different aspects of the tooth. And then if we go down into this FE mesh models down here, we can specify the value I was looking for, which is the number of loads per contact and the number of rotations. And I might come back to this a little later on once we've gone through a few more of the bits of detail on the advanced LTCA functionality. Okay, so focusing on one particular contact line. I'm going to zoom in on this one here. And then I'm going to focus from that contact line on one sample contact point. So I'm just going to look at one point, which is right at the end of the tooth. And we can have a look at it on the actual, from the end of the tooth as well. So we've got that contact point, which we've defined using that number of points and the number of rotations. And what it essentially does to calculate the bending stiffness is to apply a unit load to that contact point. Now we can't directly get the displacement of that point as we don't have an appropriate mesh around it to actually calculate that. So because we've only got a coarser mesh, what we essentially need to do is calculate the displacement of that point by interpolating from the surrounding FE mesh nodes. So this is our point here. And we're essentially interpolating from the four mesh nodes surrounding it to get the displacement at that particular point. The contact points within an advanced LTCA are coupled. So the effects of displacing contact point one, for example, so this one here, on contact point two and beyond are calculated. What we essentially get from this is a compliance matrix being built up which details each contact point's displacement per unit load when the load is applied to any other contact point. So we do have to take care of an artificial spike which appears when we're doing this process. So when we are applying a load at a contact point, we do get an artificial local spike which is in addition to the overall bending behavior of the tooth. Uh, at this stage, we actually need to remove this spike. 
And how we essentially do this is by running a second simulation along with the original simulation with the tooth actually grounded at the center line. So the compliance of these is calculated by subtracting the grounded compliance from the free compliance. And from that, we can actually remove the effect of that local spike. So for the bending stiffness, the displacement of the contact points on one tooth do affect the adjacent teeth. So this coupling is considered in master and it does this by utilizing the full FE model of the gear. So we also need to make sure in this case that we're getting or we're modeling sufficient number of teeth either side of the mesh teeth, which is one of those settings I pointed out in the advanced LTCA window. What we also need to make sure is that we have enough space modeled for the, the gear blank down here as well. So we need to make sure we have sufficient space below the tooth root in order to accurately calculate this bending behavior between teeth. And this might be kind of like an iterative process, kind of like a, a refinement study to make sure that you're getting convergence of that behavior. So once we've done all this, the FE model gives overall bulk bending. And we need to exclude at this point, oh, excuse me, we need to exclude at this point any stiffness which is close to the contact point as this is handled separately. So it's worth noting as well that the bending calculation is performed independently for each gear within the mesh. So they're not done as a mesh pair at this point. So on to contact stiffness. So the contact stiffness is calculated by deriving Hertzian deflection normal to the flank. So for the contact analysis, a pair of contacting points are utilized, and this is one from each gear within the contact. Uh, and we should note as well that in the contact stiffness, there's not as much interaction with the FE model, so it's not considered for the Hertzian analysis. So the local contact between the contacting points on each gear is considered a line contact between each gear, between each of the cylinders. And it also considers the compression of each tooth between the point of load and the center line. So that's one of the simulations we did earlier on. Now, I'm not going to go into the Hertzian approach in a lot of detail. But just for your information, that master does utilize the Weber approach to calculating Hertzian deflection normal to the flank. So this has essentially given us our, once we've done this process, we've got our bending stiffness and our contact stiffness of that gear. And this is essentially done before we actually go and calculate any results. So this is done as part of the specification that we see here. So this is our database that we're looking at of um, advanced LTCA meshes. We can actually view the meshes in here if we so wish. And then once we've actually specified the mesh to a significant degree where we've got enough information in there, we click on this generate. It may take a little bit of time, but it's essentially calculating that full contact and bending stiffness of the tooth before we actually run any load cases. So it's much, much quicker when we actually want to run load cases on the FE model. So once we've actually got those bending and contact stiffnesses, it's kind of the same process then as basic LTCA, more or less. So the contact lines are drawn on their respective teeth. We estimate the transmission error value and we perform a force balancing process yet again to converge on that transmission error or the correct or high accuracy transmission error value. And because we have the full mesh involved in here as well, we can get the root stresses as well. So we can calculate root stresses using basic LTCA, but it is just done using information in, in the standards. However, because we have the full FE mesh in here, we can get root stress calculations and we can visualize those as well. Once we've done this for one point, 
again, we perform that same iterative process. So we, we rotate the gear slightly and perform the same process again, the force balancing process. And what we end up with is our full transmission error plot as we go through a full tooth pass. Okay, it's also worth noticing, just as a point of interest, that there are an equal number of points per contact line. So you specify the number of contact points, regardless of where this is along the tooth. So this will obviously position will change as the gear rotates. It doesn't get rid of any of those contact points. It does just change the, uh, the space that's between them. And once the iterations are completed, we can get the forces on each of the points and we can get the contact patterns and transmission error results as well. Okay, so I'll come back to the validation stuff in a little while. This is just a few small examples. Now we've gone through the actual methodology behind LTCA. I don't want to go through some of the results available in master. make sure I choose the correct window. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to make sure I've run through one of these load cases at least. And I'm going to start off by going to my micro geometry mode to begin with and going to my LTCA results. So the first thing you'll notice when you're on here is this analysis report, which just kind of gives a summary of different results found in the various different tabs. Uh, this is most useful, however, if you're looking at the results for an entire design state or duty cycle. So you can look at the results for one individual load case if you so wished, and it will just show you a summary of those results. But if you want to see, for example, how the transmission error changes over an entire different set of loads, or if you want to see how the contact pattern changes over the set of loads, you can use the analysis report along with a design state or a duty cycle, and it will show you a summary of all this. You'll see we've got the variation of TE at the different loading conditions. We've got the FFT, so the fast Fourier transform at the different loading conditions. And then if we scroll further down, we see how the contact pattern changes as well. So just selecting one load and going forward to some of the different tabs. Uh, so the first one we see is the transmission error tab. So this will show you two plots. So the top one is that transmission error plot that we have been calculating by doing the LTCA analysis. And it's just showing your repeated cycle here. So it's just showing you three teeth, one after the other, three tooth passes. And as a result of this, we can also see that we have this resulting peak to peak transmission error value, which is just the difference between the peak and the trough of this plot. Now we can compare other values to this, and this is the point of this plot at the bottom. So there's a drop down here showing you multiple things you can compare against your TE, and it's just going to give you an, a little bit more understanding as to if any of these are contributing to that change in transmission error value. So let's say, for example, I look at number of teeth in contact, I can compare if my change in TE is corresponding to the change in the number of teeth. And it might lead me to uh, needing to change something, changing the contact ratios or something like that to reduce that peak to peak transmission error value. <clears throat> Moving forward to the contact chart, so it will start off just by showing you the maximum pressure chart, which is fairly standard. So it's showing you the effective face width along the x-axis. It's showing you whatever your chosen measurement for profile is along the y. And then it's showing maximum pressure. However, you do have multiple different things you can plot on here, which are accessed in this settings menu down at the bottom right. So it contains a magnitude of different things. So you've got max pressure, but you've also got things like uh, sliding velocity. You've got things which contribute to micro pitting and scuffing, power loss information, 
film thicknesses. And you can model all of these on the same plot as well. So you kind of see how this is how this is working. What you can also do is change the legend. So where I showed you the analysis report earlier on for all the different loadings, if you wanted to keep a consistent legend between those plots, you can specify a maximum minimum here and it will show you all plots with that specified. So not just the one here, but also in subsequent reports. Next up, we have the amplitude. So this is harmonic amplitude. It's a Fourier, fast Fourier transform of that transmission error plot. So for example, we can see in here that we have, it's not anywhere near sinusoidal, but it's kind of veering towards a sinusoidal shape. So one action per tooth pass, which means that we've got a lot of stuff happening in the first harmonic, but there's a lot of uh, amplitude also in the second and the third and reducing. And it's this what gets driven into our MBH mode, uh, which will be covered in other webinars and other videos at another time. Okay, and the last one I want to show here is the 3D view. So this will just give you a representation of what your gear is going through on the actual uh, model of the tooth model of the gear itself so i can show the contact pattern for example i can see how the contact lines are distributed between the teeth and the relative forces or force arrows being experienced by each of those and i can animate this as well now i haven't run an advanced ltca simulation through here unfortunately but you would be able to see even more detail with an advanced ltca simulation so you'd be able to see the distribution of root stresses down here uh, you see the, the deflection of the tooth based on the PFE mesh you've defined, uh, that kind of thing. <clears throat> then we do have a couple of other tabs here as well. So we have strip loads, which I won't dwell on too much, and root stress charts, which do require the, the running of an advanced LTCA simulation. Okay, so moving back to this few slides worth of validation I was talking about. So these have just been gathered from a number of different sources. Um, and I want to start off with an LTCA comparison. So the left and the right things here are two separate models, not to be confused with the same thing. So the thing on the left is showing, uh, I think this is a publicly available paper, but it's a comparison that was done between Masters Basic and Advanced LTCA and a similar ANSYS simulation. So the ANSYS mesh that was used can be seen in that image there. The setup was exactly the same between them. And it was basically a comparison of transmission error, so peak-to-peak -peak transmission error and mean transmission error over a torque range applied to that one gear set. So I think this was quite a simple model setup in this case. And what I want to draw your attention to is how the different results here are distributed. So I'm going to start off with basic LTCA in the green line. And I said before that basic LTCA is a very simple, well, not overly simple, but it's a very quick methodology and it's not quite as accurate as advanced LTCA or as, uh, of course, if you're doing it in an FE package. But basically it's a good way of getting a rapid optimization process carried out because you can kind of see that it's following the same trend as the advanced LTCA and the ANSYS, although it's not overly similar to them. So that's good for rapid optimization. However, then if you wanted to analyze it in a little bit more detail, you would move on to advanced LTCA. So this is the sort of maroon red line and ANSYS is the purple. And you can see that these are following to much, much closer degree. However, if we look over on the right hand side, which is just a sort of comparative measure of simulation times. Again, this is a much more complex model on the right hand side, but it should be useful for a, a comparison. You can see that basic LTCA single load case completes in a very quick amount of time. So in this particular case, it was a 12 second simulation. Advanced LTCA does it in about two minutes. And again, this is a complex model. And then the ANSYS simulation would be much much 
longer than that, so many magnitudes longer than that. So this is another similar validation we did of advanced LTCA. So this was specifically done for the inclusion of extended tip contact within master. So it basically how the contact on the tip extends based on the bending of the tooth. Uh, however, what I want to draw your eye to is just the similarity between the ANSYS simulation, which is the constant black line, and the smaller dotted line, which is the master simulation using LTCA. And again, they're very similar in their trends and their resulting values for transmission error. So taking a bit of a different approach, uh, validation of contact patterns calculated by master. So obviously these are a bit out of context here, but it, it, this is from a transfer case that was on a test rig and is a direct contact pattern comparison. And you can see very similar behavior between them in terms of what's been calculated. So these have been painted and ran on the test rig. And you can see that all the contact is on the left-hand side with some remaining paint on the right-hand side, which is what Master was also calculating. And then same on this gear as well. So we've got the same distribution of remaining paint on the actual test data with no contact calculation on the master comparison. And then the last one is looking at tooth root stresses. So this is the kind of thing you would see from advanced LTCA results that I wasn't able to show you a few minutes ago. Uh, and what this is basically saying is that the master's advanced cylindrical root stress calculation, it uses the forces obtained in master's LTCA TE calculation. Uh, to actually calculate the root stresses. And you remember that the root stresses are calculated based on that mesh that we defined in the FE gear. So we can just do a direct comparison here with root stresses from master and ANSYS, and we get almost identical values between the two. Okay, so I'm not quite finished yet. So what I want to show you is just a few of the tools that we have available within master to actually help you with microgeometry design and optimization uh, i won't spend too much time on these as i'm aware we're relatively short on time uh, but what i'm going to go through is a quick study on design space search a quick look at the optimizer within master's microgeometry mode and the statistical study so a monte carlo analysis that we can perform in master's parametric study tool and I'll do these very quickly. So I'll start off with design space search. So the design space search functionality, which I've got open in another version of master. Is I feel it may have lost my results, so never mind. It's basically a way. So design space search allows us to search a full region within a well, define search range. So what we essentially do is define a strategy within our iteration of master, and that can be fully user-driven. So the user specifies what inputs go into this. So I've made a custom strategy here, for example, which puts in or allows master to modify the crowning and slope on my gear. I've specified some ranges and the number of steps it can perform. I define some required outputs so I can say, okay, well, from all of these potentially thousands of results I've got, what kind of results do I want? So do I have a, a maximum value of peak to peak TE? Do I have a maximum contact stress? And I can filter out any designs that don't meet these values. And I can also create a number of charts at the bottom as well um, in order to view these results in different ways. <coughs> So unfortunately, by um, clicking around between so many windows, I have lost my results for this one, which is my own fault. If you are interested in 
the design space search fun functionality, I can send you the link to a, a video which goes through it in more detail. Uh, so please do get in touch if you want to see that. It is a very effective tool when looking at the entire design space, but still using your engineering knowledge to pick out designs that are suitable for you. So this is the kind of chart we would see at the end of the simulation. So we can choose the different charts, different the different axes, values, switch between these, and, and it allows us to identify effective designs, whittle it down to a few different ones, which would then be added to our set of designs up on the top left. So next I want to look at the optimizer. So the optimizer is accessed, find the right window, by right clicking on a microgeometry design and going to the optimize microgeometry tool. So this opens up this window here. And what we essentially do here is we choose the load cases, the flanks and the meshes that we want to optimize. And again, we define a strategy for what master is allowed to change. How this varies from design space search is that this is kind of like a hill climb approach. So it doesn't show you all of the available results. It will essentially iterate uh, by changing the things you've allowed it to change to try and reach your target values. So there's less user input in this one, but it might not be quite as effective in its outputs. And I have run one of these through. So you can see the iterations down here. This is one of the results of this. This is the first iteration. And what it's showing me here is the applied microgeometry to the two different flanks and the resulting contact pattern in my selected load cases. And as I go up the iterations, you can see what it's changing here. You can see the changes in the applied microgeometry. You can see the resulting contact patterns. And as I go through the iterations, you can see it's gradually getting better and better until we end up with a well-defined contact pattern. Now you have got control over different loading conditions it uses. You can select as many load cases as you want here. You can add weighting to certain load cases to make it more important to the optimizer. Uh, and it's a quite an effective tool in getting a starting point for your microgeometry design. Huh. Okay, I have just found another design space search simulation that I ran through. So I'll jump back to that very quickly just to show you. So basically what I've done is ran through that strategy that we've defined. So I've talked about this a little earlier on. We've defined strategies for what we're allowed to change on the inputs and the outputs. And then when I've actually ran this through, I can see that out of 256 potential candidates, it's found 256 in this case, uh, suitable candidates, so feasible candidates that it's actually able to get a result for. And it's actually showing these on these charts. So every one of these dots is a different one of those candidates with the star being our current design. So we can compare it to our current design. And what we essentially want to do is use this to be able to whittle all these results down to find the most effective one for us. So I could say, for example, over on the left hand side here, I've created all my candidates. I can then filter down to my specified outputs. So whatever I specified in the outputs, which then refined it down to 22 potential candidates. So we've cut out a lot of those already, which don't fit our criteria. And then I can say perform a dominant candidate search. So this then rules out any uh, any candidate here which is worse in every way than another candidate on the board which again filters it down and in this case it filtered us down to six potential results so what we could say then is i need to find which one of these we want to use in our design going forward so for example if i said oh i'm interested in these which have a low peak to peak transmission error i can highlight these And then compare these with other properties of interest. So I do have another property, another graph defined, which looks at safety factors. 
And you can see that if I switch to this, showing me my bending and contact safety, but those, still, those same designs are still highlighted. So I can whittle it down and find an appropriate design for me. When I'm happy with one or several, I add them to designs and it brings them over to the right, uh, to the left hand side over here. Okay, so lastly, I wanna look at parametric study tools, uh, which is in a different mode within master. And really I want to look at manufacturing tolerances here. So I wanna actually have a look at, okay, we've defined our nominal design. We've defined a microgeometry, which gives us low transmission error, which gives us a good contact pattern. In reality, we know that we're never gonna be able to manufacture that every time. So we want to get some kind of representation as to what kind of range we can expect. And this is done using the Monte Carlo study we've got included in master. And again, I'm gonna to jump to a different version I've got open so we don't have to run that through again. So within parametric study tool and with a Monte Carlo simulation selected, what I've basically said to my uh, master setup here is I want to allow master to modify these different things. So I've selected on the appropriate item within my assembly tree, located the item I want it to be able to vary. So in this case, I've chosen uh, crowning, barreling, slope, that kind of thing. And then I've said, okay, do I want a normal or a uniform distribution? The mean value will come in as the specified value within your current microgeometry design. And then you can apply a value for standard deviations. You then specify what data you want to output from this. So your critical parameters might be peak to peak transmission error, contact stresses, misalignment values, safety factors kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And then once we actually run that through, and it's recommended to do more than 200 steps here, we want a statistical study. So we want to really get as much of a representation as we can. So a couple of thousand steps might be quite useful to give you a good, a good distribution. However, using this example of 200 here, if I go to my reports, if I first select on the item within the assembly tree, which I was varying geometry on, it will show me plots showing the distribution of that geometry. So for example, for my crowning relief here, I can see that in the vast majority or the majority of my cases that I had a crowning between well, around about five microns. However, in the extreme of our manufacturing cases for this particular setup, I might expect to get down to about two and a half or up to about eight microns of crowning value. And it will show you that for all the inputs. I can also see the distribute on, uh, distribution on the outputs as well. So whatever I specified on my data logging setup, it's showing me distribution of those and how we might expect these to change considering our manufacturing deviations. So I can look at peak to peak transmission error, for example. I can see that in most cases, it's gonna be about 0.25 microns. However, we could get down to about 0.1 or 0.18 and up to about 0.4 in the worst case scenario. Okay, so that is quite a quick overview. Um, I appreciate that a lot of those optimizer things and optimizer method methodologies weren't gone through in too much detail. If you're interested in any particular part, please do ask us, we'll be able to provide you with some information. Uh, this webinar will be put onto our website, so you can view it again if you want to go over any of this information. And also, please do check out our website quite often, as we're often putting up new webinars. Uh, so we've got one next month, for example, which is looking at the integration of the new ISO 6336 2019 standard within MASTER. So we'll be going through that in a bit more detail on the 5th of March. And we also have various workshops which we put on as well. These are free to attend, covers a wide range of topics. If you want to learn more about Master, uh, please do sign up to one of those and would be, it'd be lovely to meet you all. Um, but 
from this webinar that's all from me if you have asked a question i will answer them within the chat window once i've gone off audio all that remains to be said is thank you very much for attending we hope you found it useful and we hope to see you at future webinars and future events